Today is Saturday, August 6th, and this is William Michael of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. It's surprising to me to see how much more and more common conspiracy theories are becoming in religious uh, debates and political debates. It seems that as time goes on, modern education, modern culture has led men to turn more and more to conspiracy theories. And in this talk, I'd like to look at a few examples of these and talk about what a conspiracy theory is and why people find them attractive. What kind of people find a conspiracy theory to be attractive? As a Catholic, I find a number of conspiracy theories used to attack the Catholic Church, to justify disobeying the Pope and bishops. First, there's obviously the Protestant Reformation, which is entirely based on a conspiracy theory. And then in modern circles, we have traditionalist groups which justify contradicting and disobeying the Pope and bishops of the Church, and they likewise turn to conspiracy theories for justification for this contradiction and disobedience. In the Protestant argument, it's, well, I should say, the Catholic Church is accused of choosing at some point in church history to turn away from true apostolic tradition, to turn away from the message of sacred scripture, and to follow after, you know, who knows what other system of teaching that they followed. There's all kinds of groups within Protestantism that criticize Catholicism. Some say they teach that salvation comes by works and not through the, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Some say that the Catholic Church has simply revived all ancient pagan religions and is this sort of quote-unquote whore of Babylon who leads the world into some kind of one-world pagan religion of the Antichrist. It just gets crazier and crazier as we look into it. But whether you're talking about Martin Luther or Henry VIII or some modern King James Version only Protestant, all of these attacks on the Catholic Church depend upon a conspiracy theory that at some point the Catholic Church chose to turn away from the true gospel and work to bring about the destruction of souls. That's the conspiracy theory. And as I said, in modern circles, there are groups that identify as Catholic, usually identify as traditionalists, and they take up a number of different arguments against the visible and real hierarchy of the Catholic Church. Some deny that the Pope and bishops in union with the Pope are even the true hierarchy of the Church. But there are a few arguments that they make, and again, these are based ultimately on conspiracy theories. The first argument suggests that at some point in 
let's say the 1900s, some anti-Catholic group infiltrated, that's sort of a secret code word for these uh, traditionalist people, some anti-Catholic group infiltrated the Catholic Church entering into the highest offices in the Church somehow and then used the Second Vatican Council to bring about the destruction of traditional Catholicism. And so everything that the Second Vatican Council produced or called for is the fruit of this infiltration of enemies in the church and it is to be rejected as false Catholicism, the destruction of true Catholicism. So there's this theory that there was an infiltration of enemies of the Catholic Church that entered into the church invisibly and brought about all of this change for the destruction of the church. And then there are others who center their talk around the apparition of Our Lady of Fatima. And I was in discussion with some of these folks this week talking about the events that took place at Fatima and their significance. Of course, I stood with the interpretation, the the public interpretation of Fatima and the message of Fatima that's published by the Catholic Church that was actually written by Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, which you can read. If you just Google the message of Fatima, Catholic Church, or even just the message of Fatima, you'll find a document on the Vatican website that contains all of the details of the history of the events that took place at Fatima and the Church's official interpretation of the message that was received at Fatima. But this uh, traditionalist crowd talks about the prophetic messages that were revealed by Our Lady to uh, Sister Lucia, one of the three um, Portuguese children to whom Our Lady appeared, and they suggest that Our Lady revealed three secrets to Sister Lucia, two of which were revealed by her to the Church and to the world, but a third, a third secret that was revealed that she chose to keep secret later revealed to the church and the church falsely revealed to the world. So the argument goes that the actual message, the actual third secret that Sister Lucia received from Our Lady, she revealed to the leadership of the church The church took that message and concealed it and publicly revealed what they called the third secret of Fatima in 2000, but that was actually a lie. They actually lied about what the third secret was, and the third secret of Fatima remains unknown to the world to this day, and the only people who understand it, of course, are these traditionalist critics of the Pope and his bishops. And so this message, again, hinges upon a conspiracy theory that the Church chose to conceal the true third secret of Fatima and reveal what actually was not the third secret of Fatima. So, from Protestantism with all its different varieties to these modern traditionalist groups and and movements in Catholic circles, we see that one thing they all have in common is they ultimately turn to a conspiracy theory as the foundation of their case. And I'd like to talk about what a conspiracy theory is and 
why these groups and many other groups with many other um, many other issues why they why they make use of conspiracy theories because it's very simple to understand a conspiracy theory first of all just by looking at the term is a theory there's no demonstrative evidence that uh, the, the statements made are true. It's a theory. There's no proof for it. And not only is it a theory that lacks any demonstrative proof, but it's based upon a conspiracy. It, it assumes the existence of a conspiracy, that someone has conspired to do something evil and to do so secretly and that this brings some evil result upon a group of people. So it's a theory. It's not demonstrated. It can never be proven to be true or to be certain. There's no demonstrative evidence and it involves some conspiracy. Now the reason why people are attracted to conspiracy theories is because these people are unrighteous people. And I'm going to explain this, so don't react. People who embrace conspiracy theories are unrighteous people. They are people who like to make accusations first and then provide proof later. Or I should say, make accusations and look for proof later. Because what's true about these conspiracy theories is that accusations are made, terrible accusations are made, in, in these cases against the leadership of the Catholic Church. Terrible accusations, the worst possible accusations are made against the Church and the people making these accusations have no demonstrative evidence for those accusations. No righteous person would ever do anything like that. No righteous person would ever publish accusations against anyone with no demonstrative evidence. In fact, in in American courts, we say that a person is presumed innocent until proven guilty. Because that's just. If a person is accused of something, it shouldn't be his job to prove that he didn't do it. Because we would face accusations 24 hours a day. And if we can't prove our innocence, what, we would be guilty of those charges? That would be ridiculous. So we always presume, or I should say, we're always supposed to presume that a person is innocent until it is demonstrated by his accusers that he has in fact done what he's being accused of. Now in ancient Israel, for example, if a person raised false accusations against another person, and was found, in the end, to be making false accusations, the accusers were put to death. There was no room for false accusations, and so a person, unless the person was suicidal and didn't care, the person would never step forward with accusations which he was not confident he could demonstrate once the accusations were made. And so accusations of wrongdoing were troubling because it would be assumed that a person making accusations had the proof on hand ready to demonstrate the truth of that accusation. But like I said, there could be people who don't even care if they were put to death and they consider making false accusations a risk worth taking. But false accusers are some of the most evil people that exist. The devil himself is, at his very core, a false accuser. He's actually described in sacred scripture as 
as the enemy of the church who constantly makes accusation against God's people. Remember in the book of Job where we saw Satan in the presence of God, what he's doing there is accusing Job of not loving God. He's accusing Job. He says, if you stretch out your hand and cause him to experience some misfortune, he will curse you to your face. That's what Satan tells God about Job. He is falsely, unjustly accusing Job of crimes and evils and sins in the presence of God with no evidence that such is true. These are malicious accusations. The devil would like to make his accusations first and then go and try to find proof for them, to actually cause them to be true by tempting people, by trying to make them commit the evils that he accuses them of. You can see the evil character of the devil. And this is what people do who make these accusations against the church with no demonstrative evidence. They make the accusations because they want them to be true. And then they go and spend the rest of their time digging around all kinds of uncertain sources to try and find some evidence that the accusations that they have already made are in fact true. But a righteous person would never do that. A righteous person would never make accusations first and then go look for evidence. So people who are interested in conspiracy theories are unrighteous people. They're people who desire the church to be torn apart. They desire the Pope to be dishonored. They desire division in the church. This is what they wish for, regardless of what they say. Because again, if a person was concerned for the unity and safety of the church, they would never raise accusations without demonstrative proof. But they desire these evils because they themselves are followers, not of Christ, not of God, but of the ways of the devil himself. They're false accusers. They make the accusations and then they spend all of their time looking for arguments and proofs to try and confirm their accusations. A good example of this is the book that Taylor Marshall published called Infiltration. These people have already made these accusations. Now they're researching to try and find the evidence. They make the accusations first, willing them to be true, and then go and look for evidence to, tr to try and convince people that they're true. This is... This is evil stuff. Now, the reason why they're interested in the conspiracy, the infiltration, the cover-up, the lie, and so on, the reason why they're, they're interested in the, the conspiracy is because they don't have any demonstrative evidence. And they even know that they have no demonstrative evidence. They've made the accusations, terrible, evil accusations. They've made those accusations publicly. They've brought all kind of dishonor upon the leadership of the church. They've filled the minds of many people with doubt and confusion. And they have failed to obtain any demonstrative or even convincing evidence that their accusations are true. And so if we've made accusations and we have no evidence to offer for those accusations, what can we do? There's a very easy solution. And what that solution is, is to say that the, 
the person we accuse is actually hiding all the evidence. We accuse the person not only of the evil to begin with, but we also accuse the person of hiding or destroying all of the evidence. And this is the double whammy. As soon as we admit we don't have the evidence, but it's because this person or this institution has hidden or even attempted to destroy all of that evidence. The people who want the accusations to be true will be satisfied. The people who want the accusations to be true will be satisfied because they already have a sinful suspicion towards an unjustly accused person or institution. They've already listened to the accusation. They've already embraced the accusation. They want the accusation to be true. They've looked for evidence and they see that no evidence has been provided, no demonstrative evidence. And wanting the accusations to be true, they're eager to listen to a story about how this institution or person that they hate has covered up the evidence because that feeds right into their hatred for that institution or that person. So the conspiracy theory is perfect because it allows the evil and the cover-up of the evidence to both be charged to the hated institution or person. And anyone who wants to go around spreading these accusations while having no evidence to demonstrate the truth of these accusations will be perfectly satisfied in a plausible conspiracy theory that the evidence is covered up, the evidence is currently in the possession of the accused party, and so on. That's perfect. It's especially perfect when the people making the accusations have no actual office or authority to do anything about it. They can't expose it. They don't have access they don't have power, they don't have resources to do anything about it. And so they're basically off the hook and are no longer responsible to provide evidence for the false accusations that they've published. If they had the power to go get the evidence, then they'd be on the hook. If they had the financial resources to go get the evidence, they'd have to go get it. If they had the office or authority to get to the evidence, they would be responsible to go get it. So the less powerful, the less authority, the less wealthy these people are, the better the conspiracy th theory serves them because it explains why they can't provide the evidence. And so these are going to be very, very popular among ordinary people. Because we can't get into the Vatican archives. We can't get into the Vatican bank accounts. We can't break into the Vatican and get to the evidence like Indiana Jones. We simply believe believe that the evidence is in there. And that's good enough for us because we want the accusations to be true. We, we're going to spread the evil accusations. We're going to promote the theory that the evidence is concealed. And 
That's really all we're interested in doing. That's why unrighteous people, especially common people, are interested in and easily influenced by conspiracy theories. There's no evidence. We can argue that the evidence is actually being concealed by the person whom we hate and are accusing. And we can take our false accusations and run with them. And everyone who hates the accused with us will be eager to embrace the false accusations. We saw this in the Protestant Reformation. Once the accusations started against the Catholic Church, all of a sudden we find there's an entire mass of men and women in the Catholic Church ready to believe every accusation and run with them. We see the same thing in these conspiracy theories about the church being infiltrated by any different group you choose, whether it's communists, homosexuals, liberals, uh, modernist or progressive scholars. P take your pick of any enemy you want, and you make them the infiltrators who, who break into the Vatican and the, into the hierarchy of the church and, and take over. And it's all, it's all concealed and secret, of course. Nobody has any, any access to the information. Nobody saw it. Nobody was paying attention. There's no record because these people are so nefarious, so evil, that not only do they know how to infiltrate into the church itself, into the highest offices, but they also know how to cover all their tracks. It's a perfect crime. And then with this secret of Fatima, that the church actually possesses the true secret, the true third secret of Fatima, but they've got it hidden away someplace. And they've published a false third secret and they did so notice they the other thing about a conspiracy theory i should mention is that the evil person who's hated is can always be accused now of doing the evil with full knowledge and intention not only did they publish the false version of the third secret of Fatima, but they did so knowingly. They did so intentionally because they're so corrupt, so evil. And you can just see when this message is fed to someone who already in his heart is disposed to hate the church, to hate the hierarchy, to hate the Pope and bishops, it's just like delicious junk food. And they gobble it all up. And this is why conspiracy theories will just abound in modern society. The access to the internet, democracy, this idea that, that we know all there is to be known that everything you need is available on YouTube or social media. When you talk to these people, they love to say things like, oh, it's as clear as day. It's so simple to see. Everything is simple and obvious and clear. There's no need for any subtle or nuanced study. There's no need for carefulness. There's no need for exactness because everything's so obvious. Any, any uneducated person with a YouTube account can see how clear this great conspiracy is. It's so obvious to everybody. And as education continues to decline, as this, the art and science of reasoning is completely abandoned in schools, as democracy spreads and just gets crazier and crazier, you know, now you can declare your own gender. Whatever, do whatever you want. It's democracy. Identify as a Catholic and, and 
declare the Pope a heretic. It's the same thing. It's the same insane spirit. And so this is why we see this Protestant zeal, which is just, at its core, hatred for the Pope and the bishops. Hatred for the hierarchy of Christ's church. And hatred for Christ himself. And when we look at these anti, anti-Catholic, anti-Christian so-called traditionalist movements that attack the Pope and Bishop with false accusations that cannot be demonstrated to be true, and we see them turning to conspiracy theories and promoting them against who? Or amongst who, I should say, among the, the common people, just like Martin Luther did at the time of the Protestant rebellion. It's always targeted to the common people, always aimed at the common people. Anybody with a social media account, anybody with a YouTube account, can understand this great fall, this great apostasy, this great corruption of the Catholic Church. Always targets the common people. And when you start to ask questions, if you ask for proof, and if these leaders of these false accusations start to get a gist that you're on to them, what's so beautiful about social media is they can simply block you. They can simply silence you on social media, and that's the end of your challenge. So they face no challenge. They control their environment. They control their audience. And if anyone makes a careful and detailed response that refutes their claims, the audience that's eager for the conspiracy theory, the audience that's eager for the false accusations, is not going to listen to a refutation or an objection, I should say. No one's going to listen to the details. No one's going to listen to Cardinal Ratzinger explaining the meaning of the message at Fatima according to the authority of the Church. No one's going to listen to the detailed theological explanation of the meaning of the message. Because you've got Joe YouTube explaining it to all of the Pope haters and telling them how their disobedience and disrespect for the Pope and bishops and priests and fellow Catholics is all justified. They're ready to listen to Joe YouTube or Tommy Facebook. They're ready for that. That's what they want. They're not going to listen to Cardinal Ratzinger explaining the theology, explaining the church's understanding of public and private revelation, explaining how private revelation simply leads us back to public revelation. They're not going to have any time for that subtle, accurate explanation of true church church teaching. They are ready to believe that the Pope is evil. They're ready to believe that they don't have to listen to anyone They're ready to believe that they can do whatever they want. They're ready to believe that cursing about priests and bishops is justified. They're ready to find that one wacky video on the internet and spreading it everywhere as if that represents the worship of the church. You know, they find one wacky mass in some isolated place and they start sharing it and they share it all over the place as if 
that mass, that activity, is actually all over the place and not just in one place at one time. They pretend that that isolated instance represents, let's say, Catholicism after the Second Vatican Council. This one wacky mass that they find a video of is now representative of Catholic worship after the Second Vatican Council. And they present this isolated example as if it's proof of something that they're accusing the Church of. Who would fall for that except a crazy person? Who would fall for that except some depraved person who's been given over to an irrational mind to think that an isolated example proves a universal assertion. That's the essence of irrational thinking. I always laugh to see these examples of the so-called modern church because what all these people ignore is something very common like the mass broadcast on EWTN. The Mass broadcast on EWTN is a modern Mass. Why not use that as an example of modern Catholicism? Go on YouTube and look up any Dominican community and share a video of one of their Masses. They celebrate the modern Mass. The Franciscans celebrate modern Masses. Why not share video of their Masses? Why find some odd, isolated Catholic priest doing his own odd thing in some odd place and present that and say, See? See? See, everybody? What we accuse the Church of is true. Look, we found one isolated example. Doesn't this prove our universal accusation? And what kind of insane person would listen to that and say, Oh yeah, that proves it. A crazy person. An evil person. A person that wants it to be true so badly that he's willing to pretend that complete nonsense is demonstrative proof. And that's the audience that these false accusers gather around themselves and they just feed it and when you ask what's the motivation for for doing this what's the motivation just follow the money just follow the money book sales cruise tickets memberships for this website or this magazine or this or that donations all over the place the motivation is just unjust money-making. The only motivation. Advertising revenue on YouTube, social media attention on Facebook and Twitter, which turns into marketing campaigns, which turns into advertising, which sells books and who knows what, merchandise, all kinds of junk to make money off of people who want false accusations to be true. And so, with that, I'm going to wrap up. That's why there's interest in conspiracy theories. That's why conspiracy theories are used by people. And when we look and see what arguments, what positions are dependent upon these conspiracy theories, we can know very quickly where the false arguments are. Are found where the unjust accusations are being made. They're being made where there's accusations before there's any proof, and when there's no proof to be found, they turn to conspiracies and say that the accused is simply covering up all the evidence.